This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out the YouTube original channel UCTV Prime at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean to be human? 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 This is an ancient and constantly recurring question. Answers vary, not just from one individual to another, but from one religious tradition to another, one culture to another, and one historical era to another. We've asked top scholars from a range of disciplines to address. What does it mean to be human? So it's a great pleasure to be here and to be talking about my favorite organ, the brain. Now, how many of you, everyone has a brain, but how many of you have actually seen one? There's a few people, probably not your own, right? If you're a medical student, you have to dissect them. Uh, so I was once asked to, to uh, <clears throat> give testimony to a subcommittee of the House in Washington, D.C. And I figured that if I'm going to talk about the brain, I should bring one with me. <laughs> so, so I have one right here. If I can dissect out, the, you can all see the, uh, the brain case, the skull, right? Do a little dissection. And protected inside this cranium, is a three pound gelatinous organ that as you can see, you can hold in the palm of your hands. So in any case, uh, I took a real one that had been preserved and <clears throat> I was stopped by the guard. And he asked me to open my briefcase and I did and he pointed at it and said, what's that? And I say, why, that's a spare brain I brought with me just in case. <laughs> <laughs> and without missing a beat, he said, oh, you won't need that in there. <laughs> but I like the idea of having a spare just in case. So what, what's amazing is that if you hold a real brain in your hand, you look down at it, and you have to realize what a magnificent device this is that nature has produced, the most complex device in the universe, as far as we know. But what's special is that if you hold a real brain, this was once a person. All of their thoughts, their memories, their wishes, their hopes and aspirations. They were all in here at one point in time. And what we need to do is to understand how did, how does it nature, how did nature get to this point where we have brains and how did they work? We have a long way to go, but we've made some progress. And that's what I want to tell you about tonight, how we got here and what progress have we made. So if we look at our nearest ancestor, the chimpanzee, we can see a reflection of ourself but our species is distinguished in many ways. We're, we, we think of ourselves as being special. But of course, all species think they're special. Because they have a different niche. And it's, it's a little bit um, self-serving to, to say that our particular niche is better than theirs. 
they, in many cases, have been around a lot longer than we have, and so one can say they've been more successful. Uh, <clears throat> for example, uh, it's true that humans are, are, are rare species in that they've been able to populate the entire world. Um, places that we didn't evolve, we evolved in Africa, but we were, there are now uh, human settlements in every continent and uh, in places that are very cold and very hot. However, the bacteria were there before us. And there, it's not possible to understand anything at all in biology without thinking about it in the context of evolution. What's, what's surprising, and this is something that came as a shock to us, ha having thought of ourselves as being special for so long, is that if you compare the genome of the chimpanzee with the genome of the human, they are 98.6% identical. So 1.4% difference. And that's uh, a change that's evolved over the last three million years when we split off. Uh, one line leading to our brains and another line leading to the chimp brain. You can see that the brain case here is very, very small compared to ours, despite the fact that the whole jawbone here and, and area of, of the, the surface area at least is similar. That somehow our species put a lot of, of, of evolution into creating a, a much larger brain for the size of the body. Now that 1.4% doesn't sound like a lot, but in fact, there are three billion base pairs in our genome, so that means on the order of um, 30 million to 60 million differences in base pairs. And, and so there's, there's a lot of room there for evolution. Now, here is uh, what I call the spiral of, of nature, which started out in the distant past over three billion years ago. We really don't know the origin of life. Uh, my colleague, Leslie Orgel, at the Salk Institute, uh, was a chemist, tried to come up with uh, possible scenarios. And of course, it's been long gone, so it's very hard to actually test uh, any of these ideas. But, at, uh, but he had a, a rule, Leslie Orgel's second rule, uh, that he came to after many, many tussles with uh, uh, ideas and nature, uh, te you know, testing his ideas and so forth. Uh, and Leslie's second rule states that nature is more clever than Leslie Orgel. <laughs> now, Leslie Orgel is one of the smartest human beings I've ever met. And, and this is very high praise. Uh, so uh, the, the earliest life was bacterial, unicellular, uh, relatively simple in terms of the genetic makeup. But what's remarkable is that many of the genes that were invented billions of years ago are still in us. They've been modified and put to different uses, but creating a protein, genes make proteins, the protein has a function, very similar functions. Uh, now, uh, it took a couple of billion years to get to the point where cells had nuclei, a nucleus that contained the, another membrane structure. Uh, but it wasn't until about a billion years ago that things really took off when invertebrates started populating the ocean and diversifying and then ultimately uh, climbing onto land. Mammals showed up about 200 million years ago and, and they're characterized by having a cerebral cortex, a neocortex, which expanded uh, to the point now where uh, it's taken over much of the brain case in primates and especially in man. Now, everything that we hold precious to us in terms of human history has all happened in the very last few dots here within, you know, recorded history uh, goes back uh, a few thousand years, maybe 10,000 years. Uh, well, 10,000 years out of uh, 3 billion years is really very, very brief. And we, we've only been here as a species over the last over a few million years. So it's really a very small fraction of the entire life of, 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 of the, the history of life here on the Earth. And in fact, what's happening now is, is really not just an expansion, it's really an explosion in terms of the extent to which humans have taken over. Seven billion of us on this planet, right? We've come to the point where we have to realize that it's a finite planet. And if we don't watch it, we're going to use up all the resources. So this is really a turning point. 
we're not there yet, but if we don't think about the problems, we're going to uh, reach a point of no return. Now, I'm a part of a group here uh, at UCSD called CARTA, which is the Center for Academic Research and Training in Anthropogeny. And anthropology is the study of the origin of humans. And it's a fascinating group I've been meeting. We've been meeting regularly now several times a year. Uh, Ajit Varki is the director. And one of the th I've learned two things. Um, it's been extraordinarily exciting. Uh, I've heard many lectures from not just biologists and anthropologists, but geologists, uh, paleontologists. It's, it's an incredible diversity of sciences that need to come to bear. But one of the things, okay, one of the things that I've really come to appreciate is how little is in the fossil record that allows us to try to piece together how we got here. It's, it's really very, very spotty. But nonetheless, it's, it's allowed us to really come put together a, a story. But the other thing that I've come to appreciate is how much we have learned since Jim Watson and Francis Crick discovered the structure of DNA back in 1953 over 50 years ago. And the reason is that now we have the capability of sequencing genomes. The human genome was sequenced, I think, 2001. And uh, the chimpanzee has been sequenced. And an enormous number of species are being sequenced every day. Uh, the, the price of sequencing has been dropping exponentially in the same way that the price of computers, the amount of computer power has been increasing exponentially. So it's really given us a, a po the possibility to compare not just the external appearances of creatures, which is what uh, paleontologists have used in the past to compare different species. You know, are the bones the same? Have they evolved? But their DNA, we can compare the DNA of all species on the Earth. Very soon we'll have all of those DNA available to us. And in those DNA are fossil records of things that have happened in the past because we can compare specific sequences in two species and see where the changes have occurred. And presumably those are related in some, in some of the cases, those will be related to changes in function. And so that's the question we need to ask. How has the human genome, through those changes, changed the brain, development of the brain, to create new capabilities? new behaviors. So here's, you've probably already seen this in the previous lecture, I just wanted just to point out where we are up here. You see this little green thing? It's just a little blip here. But we have all these ancestors that had some of our characteristics. Uh, and I want to point out in particular uh, the, our, our fellow uh, hominid, the uh, Neanderthal that radiated out of Africa about 400,000 years ago, uh, we are more recently out of Africa, probably several waves starting about 100,000 years ago to 65,000 years ago. So we're, we're at, the, at the top here uh, in terms of the most recent, and many of these, of course, are, are, in fact, all of them, I think, are probably extinct. The gorilla here is uh, on another line. Here is the chimp. So we, we split off uh, three million years ago, um, and here we are. Now, there's a really fascinating story here. So uh, two species that existed at the same time that we were uh, around, uh, Neanderthals in Western Europe and the Denisovan ancestor. This is actually an ancestor of the Denisovan. It's another uh, hominid uh, that went extinct in, in Asia, East Asia. Uh, what's remarkable is that recently, Svante Pabo has been able to, from small bones of, 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 from well-preserved uh, specimens, has been able to sequence the DNA of this extinct species. And what's, why it's remarkable is that uh, after you know, 30,000 years, the, uh, the, all the soft matter disappears and, and the DNA is a molecule and that degrades. But fortunately, and this is the, the, the strength or the, uh, the, 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 the way that we actually are, are doing the sequencing, what we actually do is break the DNA into smaller pieces and sequence each piece and then reassemble them the way you would a jigsaw puzzle. That's, that's the way that it's called shotgun sequencing. And so nature has shotgunned it for us. I mean, it's, it, it, there's no single DNA strand. It's just a lot of pieces left. But he's able to reassemble it. 
And it, it, you know, it's even closer, obviously, than the chimp. And the, the number of changes are much, much smaller. And he discovered something shocking, absolutely shocking, that about 4% of those of you with European descent, about 4% of your sequences come from the Neanderthal. So we didn't just coexist with them, we cohabited with them. <laughs> and interestingly, these, these, these sequences are not found in Africa, so they must have happened after we left Africa. And if you're East Asian, or from that part of the world, it's 6%, not with Neanderthal, but with the Denisovan ancestor. So that's uh, pretty racy. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, there's a, another paper that I think is even more shocking, and that has to do with the immune system. It's the part of the body which is responsible for fighting off uh, foreign uh, threats, uh, you know, bacteria and uh, viruses and so forth. So Peter Parham, who I actually uh, had dinner with just a few days ago, went in and asked, what about uh, the HLA sequence, which is an important part of the immune system, so it's a particular protein. He went in and he has found evidence that over 50% of the variants in the Western European gene pool can be traced back to the Neanderthal. So a large fraction of our immune system is, is, is borrowed. We took the best from them. We survived, we hope it was the best. And, uh, and it's, it's in us now. The Neanderthals didn't really die out. They are living within us, <laughs> some of us. If you look at the size of the brain, we always like to think, well, you know, the, the bigger, the better. Well, you have to, first of all, take into account the fact that you have to scale it with the size of the body because small animals have small brains, big animals have big brains. Doesn't necessarily mean they're smarter, it just means that there's, there's more of the body to control. Now, <clears throat> you may not be familiar with this kind of a graph, but I just, just want to very briefly t tell you that if each of these dots is a species of mammals, right, and you'll notice that they all fall along more or less straight line, and what's, what's being plotted here is the weight of the body on the right, on, on this axis, from you know, one gram up to, this is probably a whale up here, 1,000 kilograms, 100,000 kilograms. And, and this is the size of the brain, the weight of the brain, right? So it, it, this is what I was telling you. For those of you who know math, the uh, slope here is three quarters. So uh, it's, not, uh, it's not scaling with, directly with the, with, the si with the weight of the body, but rather with the three quarters power of the weight. Now, <clears throat> the red uh, dots here are species of primates, right? So you notice that the primate line is above the mammal line, which means, in general, primates have bigger brains. For given body weight, their brains are a little bit bigger, uh, on the order of 50% bigger. But you'll notice the human being here, this little, this is not a spot, this is a little figurine to represent the human brain. So here we are, the human brain is way up above the top there. That means that our particular species has a, a brain that really is a factor of two, greater than even it should be if you were just a, a regular primate. So maybe we are special. Now, this is a cute little thing that uh, John Allman, who's a friend of mine and uh, is a Caltech, uh, it comes from a book of his that I highly recommend if you're interested in brain evolution. This is really wonderful uh, uh, scientific American uh, level book that you can read uh, and, and learn a lot about brains and evolution. And, and this is now uh, plotting just the primates. And, and he's uh, organized them according to their feeding behavior, right? So different species have different diets. So if you look down here, uh, all these little uh, creatures with a lot of legs here, this is, these are the insect eaters. Now it turns out that uh, insects are very a uh, good source of nutrients and proteins, you know, but there's only so many ants you can find, right? So you have to, so that's why they, their, their bodies tend to be very small, but in fact, it's a very good source of, of food. Uh, the fruit eaters, have a much wider range of weights, and, and fruit is a really good way for, um, uh, to, to get uh, high quality calories that are, are going to be uh, useful, uh, easily digested, and uh, we love fruit too, right? And, 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 and then finally, there's uh, 
these uh, leaves here, well, those are the leaf eaters. The, the gorilla, for example, can just chew leaves off a tree or a bush. Now, you notice something very interesting about the leaf eaters, that they all fall below this line. This line is, this, is, is, is the mean through all of the uh, different species, some above, some below, but the leaf eaters are all below. And the reason is that in order to digest leaves, you need to have a really super digestive system. So what nature did was to sacrifice the size of the brain, right? Smaller brain, because there are a lot of leaves, it's fairly easy to find. And, but you have to have a really a ruminant style stomach that is able to use the enzymes to degrade all the food and so forth. Uh, so is really a, a trade-off, and this is actually one of the most important principles that I hope that you'll take away with you today, and that is evolution is all about being able to survive, reproduce, with as, and, and find the energy that you need, the food. You have to, in order to be able to survive, you need to find food, and you have to have a very efficient body and a very efficient brain as a trade-off whether you put your, your, uh, your, your power into the, your, your resources into the brain or the body. So our brains are really big. 20% of all the energy that we consume goes to our brains. And during the development of the brain, when you're a baby, it's 40%. Tremendous amount of energy. Very expensive, very, very demanding. And that's why we, in fact, our ancestors spent a lot of time hunting put a lot of effort into outsmarting the other species. And that's why we needed a bigger brain, more energy, and be able to not just hunt well, but also to remember well, uh, to be able to cooperate with others of our species, to be able to take, take, get, take advantage of the fact that we're able to plan ahead and we're able to remember the conditions and, and invent new ways of hunting, new, new ways of gathering food. So that's really what's been driving evolution. Okay, now I wanna just get into the brain and just tell you a little bit about what we've learned over the last 10 years and, and, and some of the work in my own lab. So when you look at the brain, it's, it's not a monolithic structure. Uh, it, it consists of many parts at many different scales as shown here from the whole central nervous system. So this is the whole brain behaving all the way down here to the molecular level, which is very, very tiny sub, below the light, light microscope level. And everywhere in between, we see structures. Synapses are the connections between neurons. Neurons are the cells, the unit of the brain. Uh, in your brain, there's 100 billion neurons. So you know that, that's, that's a, an enormous number, except if you think about it, if I had a dollar for every neuron in your brain, I couldn't even cover you know, the, the, the monthly budget deficit for the US, <laughs> right? So it's not an astronomical number. Uh, and then uh, the networks, the, the, the neurons are really special. They connect up with thousands of other neurons. In, in your computer chip, each gate only connects up with two or three other gates. It's a very different structure, architecture, that we're just beginning to understand. And then finally, uh, these are organized in sensory maps uh, and motor systems and so forth. And so we, we're neuroscientists at every single level here is, are, are working to try to understand how the pieces are organized um, and how, they, how the neurons are, the sizes and shapes. Uh, Ramon Y. Cajal, who was mentioned at the beginning of the lecture in the introduction, was perhaps the greatest neuroanatomist that we've ever had. He personally studied every neuron in every species. And he did it by using a technique called the Golgi stain that outlined sporadically just a few neurons in, in the whole slide. And what he would do is to stare at these and see the structures and the sizes and the shapes. And, and then he would imagine what these neurons were doing. How were they talking to each other? And he came up with theories, and must, many of them have survived in terms of how neurons connect up, in terms of the flow of information from one neuron to the next. It was, he was a brilliant, brilliant person. And it was, a, he, he was also an artist, and so he would draw pictures of these neurons. And, and no, those are considered collector's items today. It's these beautiful pictures that he, he drew from looking at, at the microscope. Okay, now, I'm gonna tell you a story which I think 
characterizes, I mean, it's, it's a very, it's one out of thousands and thousands of similar stories, but I think it captures what's important about how evolution changes behaviors. And it's about these little voles here. They're the little creatures that are kind of scurrying around on the ground. Um, and there are several species of voles, and, and two in particular have been studied by a group uh, headed by Larry Young now. Tom Insel has, is now the director of, uh, 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 of, of one of the institutes at NIH, NINDS, uh, when this was started. And, and so here's, here's the differences in their behavior. Um, the montane vole lives up in the mountains. It's asocial, lives in a solitary life, but it likes to mate. It's a promiscuous species. You know, whenever the female c comes across the territory, it's fair game. And, you know, we know people like this. <laughs> the prairie vole, in contrast, is very gregarious. It loves being around other voles. And when it mates, it's monogamous for life. Well, there are some people like that. Now, so this group wanted to they asked the question, well, where is the difference in the brain? Because this is, these are species that are so similar in every other respect. You know, I mean, they look the same. You have to really be an expert to tell them apart. And they have these very different behaviors. And so wh where is the difference? Well, they found one very important difference in the parts of the brain that are important for mating. And, and they're outlined here in black. And I won't go into the details except to say that the black here is a stain for a particular receptor called the arginine vasopressin receptor. And when it binds to a vasopressin peptide, it activates the receptor and then that changes the inside of the neuron. So it's a signaling system. And this particular receptor is only being expressed here where it's black in this brain region, LS. But if you stain the prairie vole, it's not expressed up there, but it's expressed down here in another structure, DB. So that means their, their action, the, 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 if you inject vasopressin into the brain, it's going to be acting at different brain locations, right? So they did the experiment. They injected arginine vasopressin or a, a control uh, cerebrospinal fluid into the brain of the montane vole. And as you can see, the montane vole, the, it's, it's affiliative behavior as measured by uh, how often it would uh, approach another vole uh, is at this low level and it's not changed. But if you inject the peptide, the AVP, into the prairie vole brain, it doubles the amount of affiliation. So that's kind of neat, because that means that uh, the, the, this behavior, this, when, the, when that peptide binds to here, nothing happens. When it binds here, it changes the affiliative behavior. So, so that's an interesting result. But now let's, they took it one step further. They said, OK, well, it turns out this receptor is found in all mammalian brains. It's in your brain. In particular, it's in a mouse brain. And so with genetics, uh, it's now possible to do a transgenic and to replace the mouse version with the prairie vole version. So it's, it's, a, it's a knock in. You knock in a new gene to replace the old one. And it turns out to function, even though the base sequences are different, it functions normally and the mouse looks normal. However, when you inject arginine vasopressin, the mouse becomes much more affiliative and a normal mouse wouldn't. So that suggests that really, this, that gives you some causal, this may be causal, not just correlative, that they were able to show that you can change the behavior of an animal simply by changing the gene. Now we can look more carefully and say, what's the difference between these two genes? Well, this is the coding region that contains the protein that's going to get expressed. Um, but there's a region before that which regulates whether or not this gene is actually going to be uh, transcribed. They're called transcription factors that bind. And, and the only difference, it turns out, is, well, there are a few differences, but the main difference is that there's a region here where there's a repeat that has been uh, inserted into the prairie vole. So that's interesting. So the difference is not in the receptor itself, but it's telling the, 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 um, the cell when it should be expressed. And, and that's why it's expressed here and, and not there in the prairie vole. Well, what's, here's what's fascinating now, OK? So someone asked the question, well, what about humans? Do we have this receptor, and you know, what, what does it look like? Well, it turns out that in humans, although the receptor is actually very, very similar, there's some changes. This is, you know, a lot of, it's been a long 100 million years, I think, since we split off from these little creatures. Uh, 
But in humans, there's a great heterogeneity in how much of the repeat. Now, it's known that in the prairie, the amount of the repeat is related to the degree of monogamy. Now, we don't know, but what if that's true in humans as well? What if the great variety of human behavior, in, with, insofar as some humans are monogamous, they tend to be mate for life, and there are others that are, you know, sow their wild oats, right? What if that could be explained by something as simple as the length of that repeat? Now, this has not been proven. It's only a conjecture. But I'll tell you, if it's true, and if you're a woman who was thinking of marrying somebody, <laughs> I'd have them check out the repeats. <laughs> okay, I just want to give you one example, and this is now a, a, another principle, which is that we have a very bad intuition about how our brain works. And it's so bad that every time we test it, it's wrong. And I'm going to give you a demonstration just to show you how wrong you are about how you see. Okay? Uh, so this is uh, taken from a textbook about vision. And it, it's all about why we see. And, 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 and these computer vision people were saying that, well, it, it's be, to allow us to be able to create an accurate representation it means an internal representation of the three-dimensional world and its properties, uh, and we use this information to perform any visual task. So this is, sounds like a really great thing to do. You use your uh, retina, it has an image, and then you extract from that objects and where they are located. And from that, I can either pick up an object or I could recognize who it is, and, and it makes a lot of sense. But that's, it, it seems reasonable, doesn't it? Okay, well, here is now, uh, tasks, I want everybody here to look at this image, and you should be able to recognize what it is, you know, it's an airplane, there's some soldiers, right? Uh, you might even recognize that it's Canadian. What I'm going to do is to flash it off, and something in the image is going to change. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but as soon as you see it, I want you to put up your hand. And the speed with which you put up your hand is an indication of how smart you are. <laughs> or dumb. <laughs> but in any case, it, it's fun. It's, it's, you'll see, it's a lot of fun. Okay, so let's get that started. Bump, 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 bump. We have a winner. Mike put his hand up. No? Bump, don't say anything. Bump, 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 bump. Another hand. Bump, 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 bump. Bump, 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 bump. <laughs> How could you miss that? Come on. It's obvious. It's the whole jet engine. Come on. What this illustrates is that when you see a scene like this, you don't have a complete internal representation. Otherwise, it would have popped out. And the fact that you only have a really good representation of what you're paying attention to. Now, if you look at this, it's impossible not to see the gen engine anymore, right? It's kind of, it pops out. And that's because you paid attention when I put the little thing up there. Your visual system now is reorganized. It's not the same as it was before. So that's a demonstration that you really, you're not really taking in everything. You have the impression that you are, but you're really not. And, and, and part of the reason is that we have a retina that's not like a camera where the pixels are all the same size. In our eyes, the retina has a very high resolution in the center, the region called the fovea, and it falls up very steeply. And so when you look around, you're putting that high resolution fovea onto the person's face or looking around, and that's when you are paying attention overtly. Okay, so now I want to uh, have a little uh, uh, Coda here to talk now about this heterogeneity, a tremendous amount of heterogeneity between humans, and, and, and it's really fascinating to think about it. Now, heterogeneity is the stuff of which natural selection works. It works by when conditions change, there will be some uh, individuals who can adapt more easily than others, and they're the ones who are going to survive. 
But if you don't have the heterogeneity to begin with, the diversity, then uh, you don't survive rapid changes, for example, in climate. Over the period during which we evolved, there have been ice ages that have lasted for many thousands of years. And uh, periodically warming up, we're in a very, very warm period right now. And that's partly why there are so many humans, because if it was much colder, believe me, they'd be in their houses, they wouldn't be out exploring. So Steve Quartz, who's a philosopher, a student of Ch Pat Churchland, who was here at uh, UCD, she, uh, in the philosophy department, uh, and Steve is now on the faculty at Caltech. Well, when he was a postdoc working with me, we wrote a, a popular book, um, and it was all about how uh, we're beginning to understand some of the mechanisms that make us different from each other. And I want to take a poll here, just, it's a marketing survey. So this is the hardback cover and this is the paperback cover. I want you to put up your hand if you like the paperback cover better than the hardback cover, okay? This is the paperback. Okay, so now put your hand up if you like this one better. Wow, okay. I'm glad, I'm glad to know that. I mean, this is, I, I, we didn't pick this. <laughs> um, no, this, this, the, the publisher here was, was responsible for this. But, but in any case, um, one of the things that we talk about in the book is um, how human behavior is molded by reward circuitry. So we've been known for quite a while that there are neurons in your brainstem which use as the neurotransmitter a substance called dopamine. And these neurons project very broadly throughout the entire uh, middle of the brain here, called the basal ganglia, and the entire uh, cerebral cortex, and very strongly into the prefrontal cortex, which is at the front part here, which is very important for planning. And it, it's been known that if you put an electrode down here and um, have a rat self-stimulate, so the rat has the choice between food or pressing the lever and getting a zap of dopamine, the rat prefers the dopamine. In fact, it will continue to do that until it dies. You know, better than food, better than sex, this is really powerful stuff. All known addictive substances act through increasing dopamine activity through several different mechanisms. You know, uh, cocaine, opium, you know, the whole uh, range, uh, nicotine. Um, and about 15 years ago, two postdocs in my lab figured something out which has really changed the way we think about the dopamine system. So it turns out dopamine is just not a pleasure molecule because it does something that allows us to make decisions without doing a lot of thinking. Uh, and, and the two postdocs were Peter Dayan uh, and Reed Montague, who've gone off and become directors of their own institutes. What they figured out was that these dopamine neurons are able to predict future reward. Now just think about that. Just having a neuron that, that active, is activated when you have something that tastes good, you know, you know, you know it tastes good, so why do you need the dopamine neuron to tell you that, right? That's because the dopamine neuron will tell you not only that it tastes good, but that it will taste good if you go out and find that substance, that food or uh, plan ahead. It's giving you insight into ways that you can improve future rewards. It's, it's, it's allowing you to make predictions about the future. What happens when these neurons die? Well, as, and this is, the, uh, Parkinson's disease is a case where these dopamine neurons die. What happens is things slow down. Um, you have difficulty moving, initiating movement. And you also have something which is a very peculiar psychological problem called anhedonia. And what that means is that you cannot take pleasure in anything. There's nothing that attracts you. You just feel that it's not worth doing anything. And if it really goes down far, you get something called locked in where you don't even move. You just sit there catatonic. And it was a miracle when a substance called L-DOPA, which is a precursor for dopamine, was first used to unlock these people, was injected in, and within minutes they could suddenly come to life. And you could ask them, you know, what was going on in your head? Oh, not much. But why didn't you move? I mean, didn't you hear me? Oh, yeah, I heard you, but, you know, it was too much effort. 
And, and it was just a complete lack of interest in the world. They just didn't have any interest in communicating or walking or doing anything. They just sat there like a, a lump. Isn't that fascinating? So this is the center for motivation. And when it goes wrong is when you're, you get hijacked. Your brain gets hijacked, and all you want to do is get this drug. And that's all you can do is plan for how you're going to get it. Everything else falls by the wayside, your family, your friends. And it's a really, really serious problem. OK, I'm going to tell you the, the punchline of the book. Uh, there's a lot in the book that has to do with the brain. But I just want to tell you a punchline of a few things that are special about humans. And we're just beginning to understand how the brain is able to accomplish some of these amazing uh, abilities that we have. So clearly, this, our language is species specific. There's no other creature in the world that has the kind of language that we have. They have to communicate. They have all kinds of warning calls. But they don't have this richly structured language. Now, there's something interesting about language in that there isn't a single one. There are many languages. Right? So why so many? Well, you know, if you think that language is important for communicating so a group can get together to do something, then why would you have more than one? Uh, languages can also be separating. It's, it separates groups. It tells you who's a part of your subgroup and who's not part of it, right? Us and them. So there, there's a, a remarkable uh, or a variety of languages in Papua New Guinea, right? It's a small island. There are almost 1,000 languages existing today in this, and in fact, Two villages separated by two or three miles can have two completely different languages that the linguists say have nothing in common. So this is the ultimate separation in terms of, you know, they, basically you can't talk to them, and it it's, it's really separates you from them. Uh, and it's an extreme case, but it may be telling us something about how language can bind us together in, on one hand and separate us on the other. Now, obviously, language is useful, but it can also be detrimental. Because it's a way for me to put ideas in your head. Those ideas may not be good for you, right? It's, it's a way for something in my brain to get into your brain. It's like a bug, like a, a, a mental virus, a meme, it's called, right? It's, it's sort of at a, at a distance, I can convince you of something. I can make you kill yourself, right? Suicide bombers, right? That, that, they've been convinced by language. So it's how powerful it is. It's really, it's really uh, has a two-edged sword. But that's not the only thing that is really special about humans. And I think that uh, there is something that occurs during development which may be even more important. So there are a lot of animals that can use tools. Chimpanzees use sticks to get insects. But if you look at chimpanzees, it never changes. They always do it the same way. And it's, it's cultural. But it's limited. There isn't any variety. There's no innovation. There's no buildup the way we see it in the humans. So what is it that allows humans to do that, to be able to create new things, new, new, new technologies? Well, first of all, um, you can see that the mother here, uh, these two mothers, are doing something with their kids. And uh, there, there's an object, and they're both attending the object. And the, the mother is communicating something to the child. It's called joint attention. It's very rare in other primates. What will happen is there's a lot of observation. The mother will be cracking a nut or something, and the, the little baby will be watching, and, 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 and then the baby will try to do something. But then it's never the case that the mother is instructing the baby to hold it like this. Right? That doesn't happen. Uh, imitation is something that you learn, we, we could learn a lot from. And humans are extraordinarily good at this. In fact, it's, it's a little bit like thievery. If you see somebody doing something a little bit better, you know, it's like a magpie. You sort of take it and you use it for yourself, right? So this is good because it spreads very quickly. But on the other hand, you want to hide. If you have something that is, is proprietary, you don't want everybody to know about it. And so you have to be careful about not sharing it if, 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 if you want to get ahead, right? And this is reflected in the way that we organize our societies. Now, what's really amazing, I think this is the key major difference that has allowed us to create the structures like the internet is the fact that we are not just a social species, there are many social species. We are hyper social. Now, this might look to you as if it were a picture of the world uh, where uh, at night from the, from the space where you know, the cities are located. It's not. This is a picture of links between friends on Facebook. So you can see the ones from Hawaii going to the United States here. Very dense here. 
and, and, and it's amazing that you could have friends spread out over the entire globe, basically, uh, of various sorts. And it, it used to be the case, right, that you were social in neighborhoods, people that you talked with and saw every day. But now you can be friends with anybody in the world. And you can get together with a common interest that ranges from you know, automobiles, stamps, you know, insects, uh, card games, you name it, and there's, some, there's a group of people who are playing it, you know, World of Warcraft. How many people have heard of that? Right, it's a computer game. These computer games, it's amazing. You know, people are thousands and millions of people out there who are playing these games hours a day. You know, that's really amazing that, that, that people would do that. That's the degree to which you can socially bond and bind people together on any arbitrary dimension. So we create new social structures. We create new games. We create new environments. And I think this is probably what's really driven the human brain over the last uh, you know, several thousand years. Like basketball didn't exist you know, a couple hundred years ago. And now there are people who are so specialized in it, who are so good at it, that they can you know, fly over the rim and they can do all these acrobatics. And it's just astonishing. You know? And who would have guessed they had those abilities? Right? In other words, if, if, you, if, if this person had grown up in a society where there wasn't any basketball, he might not be able to get a job, right? <laughs> because he has a skill that's only useful if you happen to be in a country or part of the world where they play basketball and they value it and they pay you a million dollars a year or more, right? There's something else that is very, very astonishing. I don't know if you know about this. It's called the Flynn Effect. So, you know, IQs, you know, IQ is a test you take and it's supposed to tell you how intelligent you are. It's a number and it's, it's a crude measure. It's, it's a statistic and it, it varies. You know, 100 is supposed to be the average and there's a spread of about plus or minus 25 and it gives you a bell-shaped curve, right? So it's an old story. Well, Flynn, in looking over historical data, discovered that the average IQ on a normalized test have been increasing in almost every country of the world over the last 100 years by about 10 to 15 points per generation of 30 years. And there's two different kinds of intelligence. There's uh, crystallized intelligence, which is basically facts and words, and what's called uh, fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence is, 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 not, is less culturally bound, and it has more to do with your ability to make analogies and geometric and, and, and uh, and that uh, turns out to be much more closely tied, not just to your experience, but to some innate developmental part of your brain, which is able to make these connections. And it's mainly the fluid intelligence that's increasing, right? So it's, it's much stronger, much more fluid intelligence. So how could that be? What's, nobody really understands this. I mean, some people think it, it, nutrition may be contributing, more calories, uh, better food, quality food. It certainly helps bodies grow bigger. Uh, and probably the brain gets stronger, but it's probably, you can control for that. You can find countries where nutrition hasn't changed and that can't account for it. But what, what may be happening is that we're creating new environments for ourselves, which help the brain during development and during the early childhood to be able to absorb the, the, the things that you need from this, to be able to do things in the world, to be able to m manipulate things, to, to, to be able to uh, understand new concepts and to be able to interact with different kinds of people from different cultures. Uh, a tremendous amount of learning is going on throughout your life, including your adult life. And, and that's something, again, that is hyper-developed in humans. We learn faster and better than almost all other species. There are some species who have niches where they can learn really fast, like bees. They need to learn where the good um, nectar is located, and that changes very rapidly. But uh, except for these special cases, we are the most general learners. And finally, what I think has really supercharged civilization is not language. I think language has been around for a long time. It's, it's been around probably for at least you know, tens of thousands of years. No one really knows, maybe 60,000 years. But it, it, it developed gradually. Um, and and it, it, a lot of things had to develop at the same time. The ability to talk, it's a very takes a lot of articulation, a lot of very, uh, timing is very important. But what really, I think, allowed us to take off as a civilization, not just as a bunch of, you know, 
small villages and things, is the fact that we invented writing about 10,000 years ago. This is a cuneiform tablet taken from the Mesopotamia, and it probably contains information about economic transactions, like you know, how, much is, how many barrels of wheat you're gonna be selling to somebody else. Uh, why is that important? Well, if you don't have writing, then the only thing you can pass on from one generation to the next are a bunch of stories. You know, things that have happened to you, and you, you can only go so far with that. You, if you want to accumulate knowledge, you have to have some form that is more durable, that you can pass on from one generation to the next. And it's the accumulation that's occurred over the last 10,000 years that's been made possible by the invention of writing, and the, the, the actual technology of writing has improved. There are some types of uh, like pictograms that aren't as efficient as uh, alphabets, like the Roman alphabet. And, and that really is what has allowed us to create science. And science has allowed us to create technologies like the internet, computers, automobiles. Everything you take for granted really is something that was created over the last few hundred years. All the technologies, medicines, an understanding of how the brain works, right? That's all based on the fact that we can discover new things and communicate what's true from one generation to the next. Well, we can now create mechanical devices which have a lot of properties of, 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 of animals and humans, right? Uh, and th these are not just robots that walk around like Robbie the robot. They're, these are social robots that actually interact with us. And we have one here at UCSD called Ruby the robot. And this Ruby is a robot that is in a preschool in uh, the Early Childhood Education Center here at UCSD. And uh, Javier Movellan, who's uh, fac on the faculty in the Institute for Neural Computation that I helped co-direct, has built a robot that interacts with the preschoolers, the toddlers, 18-month-old toddlers. And what Javier has learned is how is it that you can keep the attention of a little toddler who is incredibly, you know, lacks, lacks the ability to concentrate. And so what, here's what he discovered. He said that the, the first day, you know, he built this very, he put a lot of effort into the robot, the mechanics and the arm. The arm opens and closes and it, the, the head moves around, the eyes move and, you know, he, his building a robot was a big, big deal for him, right? First day, the kids ran up, what is this? Yanked the arm and pulled it off. <laughs> You know, well, what do you expect, you know, from a little kid, right? They're, they don't know anything. So Javier decided, well, I have two choices. I can either make the arm really strong so that the arm now is, is a kid that can pull it all at once, and, but now the arm may be too strong because it can injure the kid, right? So that, that's not a good idea. So instead, what he did was, if the pressure builds up, put a pressure sensor, and if it builds up, the robot cries. <laughs> and the kids stop immediately, because this is a social signal. And, and then if, if the, the robot continues to cry, they go up and hug it. <laughs> and now begins the dialogue. Now, Javier has shown that what, the way to keep the kid's attention is to be able to respond to it within a one to two seconds. If you do it too quickly, you, the kids lose interest. This is mechanical. It's not, it's not a social uh, being. But if, uh, if it's too late, the kid runs off because it looks like there's not, nothing going on. But if you respond in an appropriate way, the kid really enjoys it. What this kid is doing is pointing to a clock, and Ruby the robot rotates its head up and looks at the clock, and the kid looks to Ruby to see if Ruby's looking, and if the robot looks at the clock, the kid goes up and down, because and he's, he's controlling the robot, right? And the kid can do that for hours. The kids love this. It's a game. And now once you do that, you can now start uh, interacting with the computer screen, which is going to teach the kids new things. So this is a way that we are learning how to develop a way to create a, a whole new way of, 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 of being able to not replace teachers, but rather to enhance what teachers are able to do. Because this can be done on a personal level, one-on-one. -on -one, whereas teachers in a classroom with 20 kids can't do that individually with every kid. And we have an NSF center here at UCSD, which is sponsored by the NSF. I co-directed, it's called the Temporal Dynamics of Learning Center, and this is what it's all about. It's all about interacting with each other over time to help with education. And by the way, I cannot think of a better example of creating an environment that helps us as a species learn from the past than schools and education. No other species educates its young the way we do. 
you know, I'm not saying it's the best educational system, but <laughs> it, it really is amazing, amazing uh, that we spend as a species, you know, 20, in some cases 30 years, disconnected from the world in, in our own head, you know, trying to learn something about physics. This is what I did. <laughs> now, along with robots, there is a whole new field that's emerged called machine learning. Machine learning is what the internet companies like Google and Bing, you know, Microsoft, Yahoo, this is, these are, these are, uh, this is technology that has been developed to be able to sort through huge databases, big data, all of the data that they're collecting, and to sort through it and understand patterns, pattern recognition. And it turns out those algorithms are similar to the ones that we have in our own brains. And I helped to found this field. Uh, it, 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 there's, a found, there's a meeting called the Neural Information Processing Systems, meaning it, it's, held, uh, it's been held uh, every year for the last 25 years, the last year in Granada. We had 1,500 investigators from the entire world that, that converged, and uh, every single major uh, uh, internet information company had a booth there, and they were heavily recruiting, because we had a lot of very good students who were there looking for jobs. Machine learning is going to allow us to sort out from huge databases um, things like medicines. You know, we can have a database of illnesses and find out what medicines are effective. It could also be used to sort out from all the traffic in the world, you know, where the bad guys are. Um, it, it, it could be used for good and evil. But the fact is that we have our hands on a technology now, which is completely changing the way that we think about everything. And finally, uh, where is this all heading? We have the capability now, not just to generate enormous amounts of information and to now sort through it, but we have an even more powerful technology that's been developed to go in and manipulate genes. We can create new species. And in fact, someone here in San Diego, Craig Venter, has actually created a new bacteria that never existed before. He took different genes from different bacteria, put them together, and, and actually uh, he didn't put the genes together, he took the sequence and actually synthesized the whole set of uh, the DNA structure, put it into a cell without a nuclear, without a DNA, and showed that it was viable, right? That's pretty powerful stuff. I mean, if you could do bacteria, then maybe you can do something more sophisticated, right? Like a human. I already told you that we put a gene from the vole into the mouse, right? Well, we can mix and match. Sidney Brenner, who is a colleague of mine, shook his head when he heard about this. He said, that's not creating something new. He's a plagiarist. <laughs> he basically took genes that nature had created, you know, and, and, and simply, you know, took, cut and paste them and put them together. I mean, you know, that, 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 that's not quite kosher. But nonetheless, it proves that the technology is there. And, and the real part that, that we don't yet understand is how, do, how does evolution work? And how does it that you make changes? And how do you improve things? And how, do you, how is that all done? And that's something that we're, we're still working on. But ultimately, this is going to allow us to perhaps build new creatures that are better adapted for environments like space than we are. We weren't. It didn't evolve for going out into space to boldly go where no human has gone before. But perhaps our descendants, who may not be human, will. And maybe we'll give them a, 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 the, 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 the abilities and the, 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 the genes that they may need to be able to do that. Um, so I want to thank you all for your attention. And uh, happy to have questions.